So are you ready for it? Always. I'm sure ready for it. Good morning. Good morning. Didn't that just feel good? Just saying it felt good, and this room is just full of that. Just do it again. Good morning. Good morning. And it is a good morning. I loved it when Brenda was making the announcements and somebody spontaneously yelled out, it's a beautiful day. It is a beautiful day. That sun is shining. If you've got any goofy relatives or friends that don't believe in God, say, would you take a look outside, all right? Because God is there. The magnificence of summer season, the glory of the growing of plants and vegetables, and just that wonderful recreational activity that you and I celebrate in the season. It's a good morning. It's a good morning because of yesterday. Yesterday, in fact, there was a wonderful conference called WOW, and I understand it was a WOW conference for the women that are people of faith. You can applaud a little bit more vigorously because Eileen just knocked it out of the park with her presentation. Thank you, Eileen. It's a good morning because I know you want to help attend my funeral, but you might not be able to make it, all right? So I'm going to tell you the scripture I prearranged my funeral, which you all know is Matthew 25, verse 31. We got to go feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the distressed. Guess what? On Wednesday night, we can do all those things down at the Elgin Street Mission because it is our first barbecue for All Nations Church, labors of the Lord. The sign-up sheet is out there, 5 o'clock to 7.30, we are going to serve wonderful black Angus meat from the Tullocks. We're going to have wonderful buns from Massimiliano's and a few cherry fritters from me. And we are going to serve 250 people. So sign up for that barbecue at the desk on the way out because that's our ministry Jesus calls us for. Yes. It's a good morning because we're here. As, in fact, Brandon said, it's a good morning for our fellowship because our fellowship is powerful. We come to hear the word today, but you and I need to live that word. And often that word brings light to people that are in darkness. Today in our prayers, we need to remember the Burmaster family who have been long time all nations members and supporters. The man that passed away, John or Jack, if you knew him, he actually helped build the church so in our prayers, because of this good morning of fellowship, we support those that are kind of having a difficult morning. And then, of course, we want to make very much remember in our prayers of Jean and Eileen and the family, because today is the anniversary of our brother in Christ, Jeremy's death. And that was a day that kind of challenged all of us with regard to the darkness. But the darkness does not put the light out. And we continue with the Mahood ministry, with the blessing of Sean Morton and his ministry, and the blessing of all of us that understand that the All Nations Church is a church of God, a church of Jesus, a church of the Holy Christ, and a church of the Word. God bless you all because of that. And yes, you do have to suffer through this. This, this is the part that some of you actually think are better than the sermon. Terrible on you, terrible on you. So what's faster, heat or cold? Obviously heat, anybody can catch a cold. <laughs> if you thought that was a groaner, wait for this one, all right? What's the hottest letter in the alphabet? B, because it makes oil boil. Oh, come on, that's a thinking, come on. No, that made you think. There's a and best yet, not, this was very appropriate for yesterday. Knock, knock. Who's there? Weather. Weather. Whether there's smoke, there's fire. <laughs> so now we got all the silliness away. We need, we need to get to the seriousness. We need to get to the significance. And in fact, following in Sean, and by the way, Sean challenges me. God bless the man and the pastor. Because I have preached over 50 years in our community, and I have never, ever, ever had a series on villains, all right? And so that really challenges you to write a sermon, I can tell you that, for you to hear a sermon. Uh, Esau was pretty challenging last week, and Cain, and just all those bad guys. Well, I volunteered for the worst guy, all right? I wanted the worst villain. And so today, you're going to hear all about Judas. And before we hear about Judas, I want you to read with me. You can stay seated, but read with me the scriptures that, in fact, are involved with this villain. And it's going to be up on our screen. And we say together, 
Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, What are you about to do? Do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had been charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out and it was night. May God add his blessing to this, the reading from his holy word. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. I admired John Vanier. John Vanier in 1964 uh, found a house in France and he took two intellectually challenged men by the name of Philippe and Raphael. And he took them out of their institutions and he had them come live with him. From that humble beginning, today there's 147 large homes in 38 countries. That's been a magnificent development in inclusiveness, of understanding, and it very much is an inspiration if you think about that action. John Vanier, I have actually quoted in sermons and spe in speeches, I have called it the Vanier vision about how we should see other people. One of the quotes I like best goes like this, each person is sacred, Vanier said, no matter what his or her culture, religion, disability, or fragility. Each person is created in God's image. Each one has a heart capacity to love and to be loved. Locally, I had the honor to present John Vanier when he came to Sudbury from our Rotary Club, the Paul Harris Award, which is in fact acknowledging great humanitarian contributions. It lives the Rotary motto, service above self. In 1215, John Vanier got the prestigious Templeton Prize. The Templeton Prize was given to him for playing a central role for vulnerable people in creating an inclusive and humane society. Other recipients of this award included Mother Teresa, the Dalai Lama, and Desmond Tutu. On January 30th of this year, there was an 868-page report released documenting how John Vanier had abused in horrible and hideous ways at least 25 women. I felt betrayed. To betray one, you first must have a sense of fellowship, trust, or love with that person, a loyalty. An enemy may attack you, a competitor may deceive you, a foe may plot your demise, but, but betrayal is a grievous act committed by, in fact, betraying a trust, a love, a support you have in someone else. Failure may knock you down, but betrayal kicks you when you're down. Criticism and insult may hurt your thinking, but betrayal breaks your heart. The scriptures refer to Judas as the betrayer. He is the personification of evil, of malice, of greed, of mistrust, of hypocrisy, of scheming, and of course, of betrayal. In preparing for this sermon, I began to realize that I might have had some misplaced trust and friendship with Judas, as I did with John Vanier. First, let's think about that for just a minute. Judas was one of the disciples. He, he was one of the inner sanctum. Jesus picked Judas. Why wouldn't I pick Judas then? If Jesus says, this is one of my followers, I'm going to say, that must be a pretty good guy. For three years, Judas followed Jesus. He saw him preach and teach. 
He saw him pray and heal. He knew the ministries that were being proclaimed by Jesus. Judas was from Iscariot. Iscariot, by the way, was a southern part of Judea. All 11 other disciples came were Galileans. They were from the northern part of Judea. So Judas was the only one from that part of Judea. He is, in fact, from the epic center of the people who feel most passionate about the word. The people in Iscariot were passionate to a point of zeal that they knew the word, they lived the word, and they knew that they were called as the epicenter of revolt against those pagan Romans. We've got to get rid of those pagans. We've got to get rid of those Romans because we are true members of the faith. We know the word. And ultimately, we all know that Judas was the treasure of the disciples. So friends, doesn't that mean they had to respect them? They, they gave him that responsibility because we know that you can look after an accounting. Judas, by the way, never in any of the gospels calls Jesus Lord. And every reference to Jesus, Judas calls him only rabbi. Rabbi means teacher. So in fact, in Judas's mind, Jesus is just a teacher. He isn't the Lord like all the other disciples call him. At the Last Supper, Judas is in a seat of honor. He's sitting right beside Jesus. At one point, there are some bitter herbs put between two pieces of unleavened bread. It is then dunked in broth and eaten. It is called sop, S-O-P. That is the name for that particular sandwich. And for the host to make the sop and to give it to you was a sign of great honor to that guest. And you and I both know, because you just read it, that Jesus gives the sop to Judas. Jesus hands Judas the sop, but sadly, still, Judas can't accept Jesus as a Lord. It's still just the rabbi. Why do I tell you all that stuff? Because I might suggest that maybe Judas is somebody that we would be very comfortable with. As much as you and I have been taught in Sunday school, oh, that Judas, he's the worst villain going. There's no, I volunteer for that, Sean. I want the bad guy. I want the guy that's easiest to preach about. But when Ian said, are you preaching this Sunday? I said, yeah, and Ian, you're going to learn a lot about Judas you didn't know about, all right? And he said, I'm looking forward to it, all right? And, and the fact of the matter is, Judas has a very interesting uh, CV, all right? So, so let's say this, friends. Judas came into the courtyard today, all right? He, he's, coming, he's coming in for our fellowship. Judas is in the courtyard, and, and you recognize him, all right? You said, there's Judas. Judas Iscariot, that's the guy. Would we welcome him? Oh, yeah. You should see his ministry. He went out with the other disciples and he drove demons out. He healed people. He's a good disciple. We want to welcome him here. And then if somebody else said, you know what? I went on a holiday. I went camping down in Iscariot. Boy, I went to church down there and those guys know the word, all right? He's got some relatives that sure fit into all nations church, no doubt about that. And then if you said to Judas, you know what, we're having a little bit of a financial problem, all right? Uh, do you think you could help us with money matters? And Judas, of course, I am the treasurer of the disciples. Come on down, Judas. We think that you've got great missionary work. We think you've got great fellowship. You've got a skill set that would help us. And so, in fact, we would very much welcome the fact that Judas is part of our fellowship this morning. In fact, we might worship and welcome him better than James and John. How about James and John? Don't you think they were a little bit pushy? They were there. So who's going to be on the right hand of God with you, Jesus? I think I'd like to be there. And their mother advocates for them. I'm not sure James and John I want to sit with this morning. How about Peter? Oh, that guy, eh? He's making promises all over the place. He breaks the promises. He's pretty boastful. You know what? He is just too dramatic for all nations, church. Right? But, but this Judas guy, hey, wait a minute, what about Judas? He, he's, he, he might be sitting with us right now. But But wait. We know that this is the thief. We know that this is the man who betrayed the Son of God with a kiss for 30 silver coins. 
And so the challenge when I was writing this sermon, and the challenge for you to listen for this sermon, and the challenge for those that beyond these walls are going to talk about this sermon, is why did he do it? Now I might suggest the obvious answers are, he did it because of greed, he did it because of resentment, he did it because he wanted to control, he did it because of evil. So there's the deliverable. What did Lockheed tell us this morning about that bad guy? That he was greedy, yeah, he was, he was resentful, yeah, he, he wanted to control, and, and by the way, I think he was kind of evil. Let's go to greedy. That's the popular opinion that Judas betrayed God for money. I'm not so sure, all right? And I'll make that bold statement to you today. We know that Judas was the treasure of the disciples. In fact, if you remember on my Mother's Day sermon, I preached from the gospel about how Mary took that expensive perfume. How many denaro was it worth? (laughs) Those are the answers I used to give in science and math class too, because I was an art student. How much? A lot. That's right. It serves a lot. It was 300 denarii, all right? 300 denarii. And what was 300 denarii, if you were paying attention a month ago? That was an entire annual income for somebody that Mary... Uh, took and put all over Jesus' body, and then she took his, her hair and wiped his feet with it. And what did Judas say? According to the Gospel of John, Judas says, the money could have been used to help the poor. But then John goes on to write in verse 6, he, he said this not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. He carried the money bag and would help himself from it. That's important. What did I just tell you? that Judas would help himself from the money bag. <laughs> Three years of helping yourself, all right? He's doing okay. So, so you got to stop for a moment and think, wait a minute. You mean that Judas decided, hey, Caiaphas, if you just give me 30 silver coins, I'll end my daily theft. That doesn't make any sense at all. If, if the guy liked to steal, <laughs> he had a wonderful place to steal. And by taking the 30 coins, he was in fact closing down that money bag. Further... What about the 30 silvers a coin? And according to Matthew 26, Judas does not specify 30 silvers a coin. What does he say? Those of you with Bible study know exactly what he said. What does he say? He says to Caiaphas, what will you give me and I will deliver him to you? Do you get it? (laughs) He didn't put a price on this. He didn't say, I've got to have this. No, no. What are you going to give me? And Bible scholars have concluded, by the way, that Judas would have taken anything offered. That money was included, but maybe he would have taken a good gift, more power, more position, some favors with the temple. And by the way, don't forget, this is a bargaining economy. They haggled things out. And in fact, whatever your first offer was, it's 10% of what the person would pay you. So so hang on, let's do the math. Maybe not just the lots, all right? So if Caiaphas says, hey, Judas, I'm going to give you 30 silver coins, what should he have got? 300 silver coins. And if you want to do some Bible study on that, how about Delilah in the Old Testament? Judges 16, verse 5, she got 5,500 silver coins to betray Samson. That's quite a haircut. There's no doubt about that, all right? 5,500 coins to get Samson's haircut. And Jesus, they're going to betray him for 30 silver coins. Do you want 30 silver coins as worth in our money? 66 bucks. That's what 30 silver coins are. 66 bucks. And what is Caiaphas and all the high priests saying to, saying to Judas? We, we don't value Jesus very much. <laughs> he's kind of a nobody. This interim preacher, he's kind of a pain to us. He's interfering with the issues of our commissions to sell things for sacrifices in the temple. So you know what, Judas? We're going to give you 66 bucks to betray the Son of God because we don't value Jesus. That's Caiaphas speaking, all right? Think for a moment, Old Testament. There's a guy in the Old Testament called Zechariah. <laughs> Zechariah was a shepherd, and he was a good shepherd. And he was a hardworking shepherd. And he looked after his flock in his pasture really, really well. So he goes to get paid from the people that run the pasture, run the temple, by the way, run the pasture. And the people give him 30 pieces of silver for his pay. Which, in fact, sarcastically, 
Zechariah puts out a handsome price because it was such a small amount, but it's the same price that was paid if a slave accidentally died while working for you. You gave his master 30 pieces of silver. God, this is the best part of the sermon. There's all this wonderful history I do for us. All right, we research this stuff. We're now going to talk about Zechariah getting 30 pieces of silver. And what does God say to Zechariah? Throw it to the potter. And Zechariah tossed the money into the house of God to give it to the potter. Stop for a minute. Judas all of a sudden realizes his betrayal is really, really bad. And he feels guilty for it. And then he is fulfilling Zechariah's vivid prophecy that he what does what? He throws the 30 pieces of silver into the temple. And the Jewish leaders take that 30 pieces of silver. And what do they do with it? They buy a field. A field from who? A potter. Do you see what's happening in the Bible? All right. The Old Testament guy is saying, by the way, Zechariah, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen to Jesus and Judas. There's 30 pieces of silver on that ground, and you are going to pay, buy a field from a potter, and Judas will hang himself in that field. So, in short, I don't think Caiaphas' financial offer was nothing that would tempt a truly greedy man. What about resentment? Was Judas resentful for the reason for his betrayal of Jesus? We know that Judas was the only disciple not from Galilee. <laughs> the other 11 guys, they were all from Galilee. He, he's the guy from Iscariot. So, so the other guys, they, they tell Galilean jokes, all right? They, they play Galilean card games, all right? They have Galilean songs. They're singing away for dear life. And poor old Judas, he doesn't know the words. He doesn't know how to play the cards. He does not fit in. How do you feel when you don't fit in somewhere? When you don't fit into the team, when you don't fit into the club, when you don't fit into the neighborhood, when you don't fit into the church, how do you feel? Do you get a bit resentful? <laughs> I'm being left out. I discovered in researching this sermon that there is actually a reference that jo Judas was a follower of John the Baptist. <laughs> was he resentful about that? Did he think Jesus could have helped John a little bit more from being imprisoned or actually being beheaded? And maybe Judas didn't feel he was appreciated as the treasure of the disciples. He wasn't among Jesus' favorites. Who are, who are the favorites? Well, obviously, Peter, James, and John. How do I tell you that? Judas didn't get invited to the mountaintop. Judas didn't see the transfiguration. He was left out. Treasure, big deal. You're not important to Jesus. But what does Caiaphas do? Caiaphas makes him feel worthwhile. Hey, hey, Judas, we, we need your help. Well, we need to get this guy, Jesus. And he says, I don't care what you give me. All right, give me 30. You tell me, all right? But what did Caiaphas do? He made Judas feel worthwhile. <laughs> Judas got a muffler, okay? Remember the muffler ad? You're somebody when you got a speedy muffler, all right? Well, Judas became a speedy muffler owner, all right? Hey, I'm a somebody, all right? Caiaphas is making me feel a somebody. And by the way, friends, who's my new friend? Caiaphas. And what does Caiaphas do? Caiaphas runs the temple. He's the senior pastor. He's the guy that makes the decisions. This Caiaphas is my new best friend. Forget Jesus and those losers who all they want to do is teach and preach to the poor. I'm with the movers and the shakers, the people who run the temple. They are now needing me. In short, resentment likely did fuel the fires of vanity and perhaps of a hurt ego. But I go back to the fact that Judas spent three years as extended family with Jesus. I I'm not sure he would use a kiss of affection as a cue for crucifixion. What about control? Did Judas want to control Jesus? To be that revolutionary king to overthrow the Romans? Most people believed at the time that the Messiah would in fact liberate the Roman oppression. But it became clear to Judas as he saw Jesus going into Jerusalem. And as we preached a few weeks ago, Jesus wasn't on a stallion. What did I tell you about horses back then? You know, warrior kings rode horses into conquered cities. How did Jesus go into Jerusalem? <laughs> On a donkey, all right? He's that prince of peace. So you see Judas and all his buddies from Iscariot saying, my goodness, this guy's not on a horse, he's on a donkey. 
and, and I can literally see that the future is crucifixion to my dream of this man liberating us from the oppressive pagan Romans. Judas then took action. He had not the slightest doubt that Jesus could, in fact, do what he wanted him to do. That, in fact, Jesus could call upon those armies of angels that he reflected upon in the Garden of Gethsemane. And that, in fact, he could be that revolutionary king. And Judas is going to make him do that. He's going to compel Jesus to do what he wants him to do because he can do it. And this is the real tragedy of Judas. He refused to accept Jesus Christ as he was and sought to make Jesus into what he wanted him to be. I always tell Jean, I got deliverables. Well, today's the deliverable at this part of the sermon. As blasphemous as this sounds, I will publicly confess to you that on occasion in my life, I want Jesus to be in my image, not his image. Did you hear what Lahi just said? That, that I want Jesus in my image, not his image. How often do you do that? How often do you make Jesus into your image rather than you being in his image? What am I talking about? My Jesus? The Jerry Lockheed Jesus? Oh my goodness. He would love to preach the gospel of prosperity. That's what that Jesus, that's, that's my Jesus, okay? What's he going to tell you? He's going to tell you, hey, folks, everybody work real, real hard, and you're all going to succeed, and we're all going to make a million dollars, and that's a lot of nonsense, but turn on your radios, friends, and there's people on that radio evangelizing that today, that we have a gospel of prosperity, and that is not what Jesus taught. But we sometimes want Jesus in our model, in our making, to be able to preach that because I feel good about that. And, and in my Jesus, <laughs> don't put your light under a basket. Put it on a lampstand, all right? Sounds familiar, doesn't it? It absolutely does. But in that room, don't have anybody you don't like, right? In my lampstand with my light, it's full of people I like, that I recognize, that act like me, that sound like me, that look like me, and I'm comfortable with that because I don't want people that make me uncomfortable, people I don't know. I don't want to share my light because I'm selfish about my light. My Jesus, <laughs> my Jesus is Santa Claus, all right? Because I can start every one of my prayers with, Jesus, give me this, and give me that, and give me this, and give me that. <laughs> but that other Jesus, <laughs> he wants me to understand, I pray, make me this and make me that. And that God's voice, his Father, he is God, is going to tell me some inconvenient and uncomfortable things as a direction in my life. And I say, whoa, I prefer my Jesus as Santa Claus. And best yet, my Jesus goes to Caiaphas' temple. Oh, my Jesus. Oh, yeah, what do we do with that temple? We sacrifice lambs. <laughs> we're, we're good at that. And in fact, what we'd like you to do is if you'd buy a lamb out in the courtyard, all right, we'll bring it in here. We get a commission for that lamb, and then we'll sacrifice the lamb, and, and that will be good because we have a ritual of praise and prayer which is stagnant, which is apathetic, which is complacent, and we sit in the temple in God's house, and we are not inspired, we are not moved, we are not called to action. But that other Jesus, that other Jesus is the sacrifice lamb. That other Jesus dies on a cross for us. That other Jesus looks down and says, forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. And with that gift of grace that you and I, with the real Jesus, can seek repentance and have that fire in our bellies that we call the Holy Spirit. Judas very much wanted to control Jesus, but the betrayal was not for crucifixion. It was to conquer the Romans. I believe that greed Resentment and control soiled Jesus. In that darkness, Satan possesses Judas to betray Jesus. Without Satan, Judas could have reconciled his sins. And this is the difficult part of the sermon. Gina and I talked about it last Sunday. But I believe that if Judas understood God, if he had understood Jesus... He would know that you and I have a forgiving and merciful God. 
That if he had gone to God and said, Hey, God, I messed up. Please forgive me. That God would have forgiven him. Because God does not want us to be sinful. God does not wish anybody in this church to sin. That the fact of the matter is the darkness is something we choose and embrace. And God wants us to stay in the light with his son Jesus. But Judas didn't get that. Judas very much did not understand that. But you understand that God knows you in your mother's womb. <laughs> That's a long time, friends. He knows you in your mother's womb. All right? Jesus knew Judas when he called him to be a disciple. He knew that Judas was going to betray him. But he still accepted him as a disciple. Jesus loved Judas like he loved all the other disciples. How can I be so bold to tell you that? Wait a minute. Jesus washed Judas' feet. Jesus broke the bread, the sop, in the upper room with Judas. He knew what Judas was about to do, but he continued to open his arms to him and say, Hey, Judas, <laughs> come on, man. Don't do it. And then he says, well, if you're going to, do it now. It is there that Judas fulfills his destiny. John 13, verse 2 says, And the supper being ended, the devil having now put into the hearts of Judas Iscariot to betray Jesus. And John 18, verse 5 writes, In the garden of Gethsemane, where Judas gives Jesus the kiss of betrayal, while Jesus was speaking to the soldiers, John states, and I quote, And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. There's a world of meaning in that little phrase. Judas had gone to the other side. He was not just physically standing with them. He was spiritually standing with them. His betrayal was there. It was obvious. It was public. It was visible. It was undeniable. So what went wrong with Judas? Why did he not resist the devil? Because according to James chapter 4, verse 7, we learn if we will resist the devil... He will flee from us. But good old Judas, he embraces the devil. When Satan left him, he realized the magnitude of his sin, and he tried to return the 30 silver coins. <laughs> and what does his new best friend do with them? He comes up and says, hey, hey Caiaphas, I, I don't want this anymore. I, 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 take these back. <laughs> right? And what does Caiaphas do? Throw them on the ground. Not my problem. Nothing to do with those. You took the coins. They're your coins. And so then Judas goes out and doesn't talk to God. And he doesn't talk to Jesus. Judas does what humanity so often does, messes up. Judas kills himself to be like Jesus in death because he didn't understand the gift of grace and forgiveness. So Ju Judas had a man-made answer for all we've just talked about this morning, that in fact he would make the answer. He doesn't need to seek an answer of forgiveness, a second chance from Jesus and God. So he commits suicide. The book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 18, it says, When Judas hung himself, his bowels bursted. And not to get too much into history because it's 1105, but they biblical reference of your bowels bursting. They actually believe that the soul was an organ in your body. And when your bowels burst, you burst your soul. In other words, Judas had destroyed his soul because he could not understand about rejecting Satan. I got a new term for my sermon this morning. I hope you take it home and think about it. I think that there is a Satan space in all our souls. That's an interesting term, a little alliteration there. A Satan space in all our souls. A place that Satan wants to possess and pollute us with. And you know what the entry sins? <laughs> they can be pretty benign, eh? Taking a few bucks out of the money bag, no big deal, eh? And telling the Galileans, I don't like how you sing songs, kind of benign, eh? You know, talking to the head of the church, pretty benign, isn't it? But no, the, the sins are out there. How about the sin of lust, Okay. How many people want to see Martha Stewart in a bikini? I'm a guy that gets a pension that has an adjective old in it. Right? I'm pleased they got an 81-year-old woman with a bikini on. All right, There's still hope for me in a Speedo. All right? but, but, 
But if you're going to put a bikini woman on the front of the Sports Illustrated, I think you want people to say, oh, I'm kind of lustful about that woman that cooks real well called Martha Stewart, all right? How about coveting, hey? Oh, I love those big houses, don't you? I want a, I want a bigger car, a bigger motorcycle, bigger whatever. When I was living over the apartments of a grocery store called Gratoli's on Spruce Street, on Sunday afternoons, my mom and dad would put Joffrey and I in the back seat, and we would drive up to look at the big houses on Wembley Drive, on Kingsmount, and then if you really wanted to see the big houses, you went over to Ripple Road and to Crown, because that's where the big houses were. And those people had money, and they were in the big houses, especially if you're living in an apartment over a grocery store. Okay, how about greed? On my workplace, those lottery groups come and go, all right? And everybody's going to win that lottery. <laughs> what are they going to do with it? Spend money. I've yet to have anybody tell me if they won the $64 million, they just give it all away. Everybody says they'll give some to their relatives. That might be debatable on the relatives. But having said that, the fact of the matter is I want to win big because I got stuff to do. How about blasphemy? All right, to turn on the radio, all right? You can hear Jesus' name referred to in a lot of ways that aren't sacred, I can tell you. Movies, television, but, but, but we say that, that communication is just fine. How about the Sabbath, <laughs> Sunday? Do, do we have time for the liturgy to come to God's house and to praise? The folks on the radio station, the people on live stream, you today have decided somewhere in my daytime of Sunday, I'm going to spend some time with God and God's house, praising God, praying God, preaching God. But the people who tell you, oh no, I've got a golf tea time. Oh, oh no, I have got a soccer matchup for my kids. Oh no, I got to go to camp because camp season is so short in the Sudbury area. I don't have time for God. Yeah, you do, right? You do. Everybody has time for God. We have time for Jesus. We have time for worship and praise and prayer and preaching. We have time. This morning, we need to purge our personality of Judas. We need to seek the light of fellowship for empowerment, for enlightenment, and for in ourselves encouragement. Not just for ourselves, but for others with the word. Every Sunday, Gene and I have a visit. And every Sunday, Gene says to me, Jerry, you got to preach the word. And my message to you this morning is, folks, you got to know the word. You got to learn the word. You got to preach the word. You got to teach the word. You got to have the word because that word has life. And that life brings light that the darkness can never put out. And I've told you that many times from this platform. But I'm going to conclude with an illustration that maybe makes you better understand about that light. When a flashlight grows dim or quits working, you don't throw it away. You change the batteries. When a person messes up and finds themselves in a dark place, do you cast them away in your life? Of course not. You help them change their batteries. Some of us, <laughs> some of us are AA batteries, attention and affection. Some of us are AAA batteries, attention, affection, and acceptance. Then there's those good C batteries. <laughs> they need compassion. And how about those big jobbies, the D batteries? They need direction. But if they still don't seem to shine, simply sitting with them quietly and share your light. Remembering the proverb, it's better to light one candle than curse the darkness. And Judas teaches us that without the Lord's light, that you and I are cursed in the devil's darkness. Judas's life challenges everyone who professes to be religious, but is really lost, who knows about Jesus, but doesn't know Jesus. And my challenge to you this morning as I conclude, do you know Jesus? Not as a rabbi, but as a Lord and Savior who died on a cross for every one of us so that you and I can dwell in his Father's house forever and ever and ever. And for that, we all say, Amen. Amen. So back to my wonderful term, deliverable. 
the best part of our services, the best part of the tradition of All Nations Church is this little cup. <laughs> this is the cup that was in the upper room with the bread and the wine. This is the cup that makes you and I in communion with Jesus. This is the cup that reminds us of his sacrifice as he reminded us as he broke the bread and he poured the wine. So, so I want you to hold that cup. Don't worry if you can't get the cellophane off. I used to say to Jeremy, I can never get that cellophane off. Usually you're by the time you're with the bread before I, you're with the wine before I get to the bread. Well, you'll get there, all right? Don't worry about it. But, but I want you to hold it. I want you to hold it and think about being with those other 11 disciples. Think about Jesus is having dinner, supper with us. And as we hold that cup, we're all going to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So we're going to go to the Gospel of Luke. And please say this with me. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. continue with the holy word saying in the same way after the supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new cup in my blood which is poured out for you God bless you everyone amen <laughs>